I'm going to go ahead and start recording. So welcome everyone. Again, my name is Amanda Carrieth Thompson. I am with the Council on Culture and Arts, and we are here today to celebrate April Fitzpatrick, who is our highlighted artist. She's got a solo exhibition right now at the Artport Gallery, which is located in Tallahassee's International Airport. Her show is titled A Symbolic Transformation, Artworks by April Fitzpatrick. And we are so, so honored to have her here with us today for this artist talk. Thank you for being here, April. Thank you for having me, Amanda. Absolutely, absolutely. Couple of housekeeping issues. For those who are joining us today, we are gonna be happy to take your questions if you wanna type them into the chat. And I see there are a couple of comments already. Um, we've got um, a note from Chris saying, hi, good afternoon. We're, well, we're delighted to have you, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Katrina says, hi, April. Um, Katrina, we're happy to have you here with us today. Um, for those of you who haven't tried out the chat function, it um, depends on sort of how you have your screen set up. But um, if you hit your chat button, you'll be able to send us some messages and some questions along the way. All right, and um, we're going to be, you know, sharing screens and popping around a little bit. So um, we're we're going to take us on a bit of a journey, and we're very happy to have everyone with us. Um, April, let's let's dive in first with sort of your background, if you would tell us a little bit about how you came to be an artist and um, a board certified art therapist, because those two things are, you know, both professional and personal to you. Right. So what, what was it about the visual arts that really made you essentially dedicate your entire life <laughs> to the practice? Um, this is very interesting because I sit with this question a whole lot. Um, I would say my immediate start that I think I was becoming into awareness is when I went to Africa in 2010 and I fell in love with the Adikra symbols and how the Akan culture, culture um, really worked with um, symbols to express narratives. And so I came back with that, but it was a very suppressed and um, settled thought. In that same time frame, I took an art class in undergraduate where I went to Tulu College and I was majoring in psychology. And um, again, I took an art class, not really thinking anything of it, but I remember enjoying it. And um, I remember saying to myself, if I just learn light and shadow, I can understand, you know, paint and art. Um, I think in that moment, the universe was preparing me um, for what was to come. And what happened was in 2013, at the top of that year, January, my grandmother um, unexpectedly passed. Um, and I was in a new transition myself. I had just moved to Memphis, Tennessee. Um, working in um, the psychology, mental health field, uh, working with at-risk behavioral youth. And she, my grandmother called me every Tuesday. So she was kind of my grounding space for each week. So I slipped into a deep depression because I had not um, really talked about death in the way to understand grief or loss within my community, within my personal family. So I was miles away from home going through this experience alone. Um, and so I remember just going to the store to get paint supplies because I remember in my art class, well, I, at least I know I can paint. I know how to do that. And so it started off as something that would just take my mind off of uh, my grandmother's death. And um, I never stopped. And I remember telling myself, like, this feels really good. And I think it's something more here. Um, and so I said, I wonder if I could help people back home through art that are struggling with what I'm struggling with and combine art and mental health. At the time, I did not know art therapy exists or was even a thing. Mm. So I'm Googling and I see um, a program in London. I said, I'm going to apply to be art therapist. I'm going to go to art therapy school. I applied. School was so difficult. I did not get in. Um, and so it was, it was really competitive, but I saw FSU as an opportunity and that was closest to Mississippi. And so um, I only applied to FSU, nowhere else, and I got accepted. And that started my art therapy journey in 2015. And I've been in Tallahassee ever since. Um, and while on that art therapy journey, I will always go back to art, but I never could dedicate my time as I wanted to because grad school um, just was, you know, 
demanding. Um, and once I graduated, um, I, it still rested on my spirit, just combining both, combining both. I never wanted to choose my art therapist identity um, over my art identity or vice versa. And so for the past five years after grad school, I've been working to just integrate and merge those two. And um, committing to that journey is ultimately how I am here now. That is such a powerful origin story. And certainly I think, um, you know, a, a lot of folks use the arts as a grief response very, very naturally. I mean, whether they're directed to do that by a professional that they're working with, or if they are directed to do that through their heart, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's the visual arts or music or theater or dance or, you know, writing, I think it can mm -hmm. be such a therapeutic and, and cathartic practice um, when, when you're, when you're struggling with, with loss. Um, I know that trauma is a very big, um, um, focus area of yours as well. And you work very, um, very diligently on tackling race-based trauma specifically. Can you talk a little bit about that with us and how you came to that particular area of focus, um, and, and maybe your findings and, and research or experiences, um, in that area? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I would say that in my undergraduate, uh, field, I was very Afrocentric focused. Um, I took Black psychology my junior year and that opened up, a uh, um, different lens that had not been introduced to me. And I began to marry the literature and the knowledge around that with my experience in Africa um, from that trip. And so from that um, and through my art practice, I was forced to reckon with my own identity, um, social constructs that had shaped me and who I was and how I showed up in different spaces, um, what I believed about myself. And so I began to use art to peel away those layers that I felt like had been um, impacted by race-based traumatic stress, um, expanding well beyond me, my mother, and um, for own. So you start to look at your life through a very um, familiar lens, and then you go to the immediate community lens, and then it gets larger through the social, historical, cultural lens. And so each layer, um, I found my identity intersected with what it meant to be um, a Black woman in America and some of my own racial experiences that I had bedded so deeply, even as a child being um, from the state of Mississippi um, and the powerful symbolism that I had, that had been told to me about where to go and what to do. Um, and it becomes a way of life. So you really don't give much attention to it until you start to reckon with your own self, with your own freedom, with your own trauma. And I started to realize that much of my trauma had been rooted in race-based traumatic stress, even if it was a byproduct of what other people had been impacted by and how their um, life had been situated. Um, and so I just felt like if I could create something, a model, um, a symbol that could bring people to the table, and have conversations around this very challenging and spiky topic that maybe we would get somewhere. And so now I've committed my art therapy practice to solely focus on um, race-based traumatic stress because I think when we hone in on those, we unleash all the other layers that people um, are dealing with because it ultimately goes back to your perceptions and your beliefs um, about yourself and that informs how you move and navigate this world and a lot of people's um, perceptions and beliefs, particularly in the back, Black community about themselves, have been situate, situated from a very Eurocentric lens um, and a very anti-Black lens. And so um, I use my work to reclaim that narrative and bring a more strengths-based approach and not see things from a deficit. Thank you for that. I, I, heard, I heard several key words that I sort of picked up on while you were describing um, that focus area of yours. And one of them was um, layers. You're talking about peeling away layers. And I think that's such an interesting um, descriptor because your work, your yeah. artwork is extraordinarily layered. You mm -hmm. are, you're using a variety of media you're using collage techniques, you are applying things on top of other things. And so that 
as a metaphor, is a really interesting follow through. Um, the other thing I heard you say, of course, was you know the discussion of of the symbols that go along with your upbringing in Mississippi, um, and of course, your artwork is rich with symbolic you know language and motifs. We can talk a little bit more about the pineapple and and what that means to you, but I know that your symbols don't just stop with the pineapple. Right. Um, additionally, I heard you say that your art making helps you and and also others deal with this spiky topic. Yeah. Which I also think is a really interesting descriptor because in many of your artworks. <laughs> there are a variety of pieces that have been applied to the surface of um, your, your, you know, artworks that have a very spiky textural component. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I'd like to maybe, if you're willing, um, yeah. talk a little bit about like your technique and the mm -hmm. materials that you're using, how you're applying them to the surfaces and, um, you know, maybe, maybe once we kind of get an overview of that, we can even go over to the online gallery, which yeah. is um, a complement to the show that we're presenting in physical form. And maybe we can point out a couple of pieces that are particularly good examples of some of your methodology and, and your material use. Yeah, no, I appreciate you. Um, and I really thank you for bringing that forward because I don't talk about that much. Um, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to engage in that. So I'm gonna try to keep this as simple and concise as possible. Um, <laughs> I, I have to tell those who are joining us that when, when we were working together to curate this show, there was one point when I said to April, this is a doctoral dissertation. Yes, <laughs> I did. mean, it is so rich and researched and nuanced and deep and you know the 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 encapsulation of all of your thinking and um work into mm -hmm. this single exhibition was a monumental task so i am so glad to have this opportunity to unpack some of that it's such cerebral artwork and yes. um it's also aesthetically striking. So, you know, whether or not as a gallery goer, you're jumping into the, you know, to the exhibition um, and just looking at it, you know, from a purely aesthetic point, um, those folks are gonna have one particular read and the folks who spend a little bit more time with the artworks and the exhibition description are gonna walk away with a slightly different experience. So, so walk us through your materials and your and your techniques, and then we can kind of dive into the meaning behind all of that too, because there's a okay. lot to unpack. <laughs> all right, all right. So, what I will start off by saying that my ultimate aim in each process I do is thinking about healing and freedom. And so, I'm looking at myself as a triad, as a Black female visual artist as an art therapist and my client therapist relationships, and then just as a standing community person who also has had struggles with mental health issues, um, particularly depression and anxiety. So those three things are working as I'm thinking about how I approach my pieces. Um, it's interesting, of course, that you bring up the dissertation skills because I do love, love, love research. Um, and so my work encompasses my research regarding race-based traumatic stress, PTSD, um, African-American psychology, um, Black visual artists. So I'm pulling from all of these um, keywords and concepts and kind of sitting with them together. And from that, I take different journeys um, alongside that path, that path in the sense of I may focus on how I interact with my Black female sexuality and how I've watched other Black women interact around it. I may interact around um, slavery and historical trauma in the context of Mississippi. You know, so I take all of these different concepts and I go through these journeys um, and I allow myself to have a very primitive experience in that um, sometimes I laugh, I cry, I get upset, I'm angered. Um, and a part of that is me welcoming in the humanness of myself 
And again, peeling back that perfectionist, those social constructs of that you can't feel or you shouldn't feel as well, you should let things go. Um, and I almost marry myself imaginatively in the shoes of others, because that is a practice that as a therapist, we're trying to be empathetic and kind of understand where the other person is coming from. So I spend time going through the visual journeys of other Black artists, particularly from the Harlem Renaissance, and I move my way into more contemporary, modern-based artists, and I look at the overlaps of our interests, and I place myself doing those time frames. Um, I do that self, I do that also with um, my family. Sometimes I place and I imagine my mother back in the time frame when she may have lived based on what I know her as now and based on what was going on um, in the world. And so um, it's, it's a very chaotic journey because I'm jumping from these emotions and situations all the time. But I like that because I really think it mirrors therapy. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times when we think about healing and we go to therapy, we really have this um, one dimensional way that we start from point A and we're gonna end somewhere when you can start from point A, you can go to point C, you can jump to J, you can go back to A. So it's never a linear process. And even when you regress or take steps back, it's still a progress of change. And that's sometimes hard for people to accept within therapy. So I really mirror and embody that practice of those things. And so once I've kind of nestled in my spirit, um, that experience, I start to see that visually through symbols, through images, through pictures. And then I began to do my layering out process. Do I want to use collage images to represent this? Do I want to use found objects to represent this type of feeling? Um, do I want to use fabric to tell this story? Do I want to be very um, direct? Do I want to be mysterious? Um, do I want to be ambiguous? So I intentionally use materials to marry them all together at one time to capture all of these moments when we're trying to think about um, healing in relation to the Black experience and race-based traumatic stress. Um, and from there, I take an intuitive process of not questioning where I place my mark. Um, to me, that's activating a sense of confidence and self-esteem and almost spirit-led that everything that's placed where it needs to be is going where it needs to be. And everything is working together for the good. And so I, I really, really rely on my spiritual background because working in that space when I'm most vulnerable, and that's when I feel most connected to God in the sense that um, I am releasing my control and I can hear a higher power um, and I feel comfortable in, in relief and freedom with that. And so um, that process carries on um, for months at a time. Um, and, and, and that gets tricky because I am balancing that process alone, still trying to show up for eight to five. So there's a struggle that happens, um, with that, um, which is also, I enter in a part of the process. Some of my best work has come out of my contemplating. Mm. Do I go to work today <laughs> or do I stay home, um, and paint? And so ultimately that's how my process, um, ends up looking and I end with marrying um, contemporary abstraction with experimental narrative. So I'm telling um, stories in a very surrealistic, abstract, realism type of way. Um, but I want my viewers to have questions, many, many questions. And I want to, I never want them to understand what's going on or know the exact answer because the journey to healing sometimes isn't about the end product of understanding, but just the process and the courage of going through that. Um, and I want them to feel free and comfortable in whatever the art does for them and makes them feel um, in that moment of time they're in. And so, um, yeah, in some ways, it reminds me of patchwork. I wouldn't say quilting, but often when I'm just patching, and the, the layers are symbolic of um, me peeling back the layers in the process, but also intentionally layering up so that people understand the work that you have to do when you say you want to heal yeah. or you want to help people heal. Like 
it's so much time and work to get past a layer. Um, and so if I can use symbolism and vibrant colors and found objects, maybe that can in turn replicate in their personal understanding of how they view patients and working with other people or working with themselves. I know that was a lot. I know. It's not, it's, it's, but it's, it's a good, a lot. It's, it's <laughs> such, um, yeah, I think, I think there are so many, um, people who, um, are interested in an artist process. And I think that certainly that's true for, for, you know, the folks who are joining us here today, but I think you bring an additional layer, um, being a healthcare practitioner, there's an additional process that goes along with that. And so, you know, understanding how those two dovetail into one another and inform one another is, um, is such a, um, um, an eye-opening, you know, thing to hear you talk about. Um, can we, why don't we pop over to the online gallery together? Um, okay. And while I'm doing that, folks, um, if, if you all are here with us listening and you have any questions, I mean, April, you gave us just a really nice transition and invitation just there at the end when you said you, you're asking people to question, yeah. um, to question your work. And um, we have an opportunity today for all of you to question April directly. So if you do have a question, please feel free just to type it in the chat while we talk. And, um, you know, if there's a good place for us to address your question, we will absolutely happily do that. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to pop us over to the online gallery, and this is, um, again, um, um, a digital representation of the works that are on view currently at the physical Artport Gallery, which is located in the Tallahassee International Airport. Um, of course, all of these exhibitions are brought to you by the Council on Culture and Arts mm -hmm. um, as the managers and overseers of the city of Tallahassee's public art program. So um, we get a chance to together basically tour this exhibition um, in, a, in a digital way with the artist mm -hmm. herself. So April, um, we, we mentioned earlier that symbology is very important to you and in your work. Um, mm -hmm. Pineapples are a major motif that we see that recur throughout your work. Of course, you have lots of other, you know, symbolic um, language and vocabulary that you use throughout as well. Um, do you want to maybe take us through some of the pieces themselves and, and maybe kind of um, give us I don't know that dissection is the right word, but yeah. <laughs> if you can, you know, kind of give us a bit of a docent tour if, if you'd like to. And um, of course I can scroll through the mm -hmm. entire exhibition and we can pick any one or two or 12. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's scroll back to the top because these are, are um, I have a pre pretty brief synopsis that people should be able to marry based on the context I've given. So impressionable, um, it just talks about the vulnerability of um, young black girlhood um, and the things that you kind of uh, navigate through and understand as you're um, just growing into life and womanhood. So there, there's this bliss of innocence. Um, there's this naivety. Um, there's this eagerness and curiosity, but there's also um, this weighted pressure um of themes experiences social constructs coming from every different line of life um where you're really impressionable there's a very impressionable stage of your life so i took a pointillism type of phase towards this to kind of um show the impact of that of the of each ex experience really leaves an in-depth impression and if we look at this from a mental health perspective, we talk about adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. and start to think about how those early on experiences began to situate the emotional language um, and uh, the perception of how you see yourself and you're navigating life. So that one is what that was about. Um, North Star is one I don't talk about much, um, but it's a pretty interesting piece. And I guess I pay homage to... Um, the ancestral light of how um, 
Black people and people of African descent would use hairstyles um, as roadmaps, um, use hairstyles to hide rice and grains when they were being transported over, and the crown being indicative of the higher you wore your hair, the closer you were to God. Um, so I was just wanted to be playful and very childlike, but very intentional um, around that piece. Um, we can jump to Atlantic Census. Okay. Let's find Atlantic Census. Here we go. Um, Atlantic Census takes more on a role of um, mapping. Um, I'm going to pronounce this word wrong because I actually just became familiar with it, but it's very, it's, it's been out there. I just, I don't know where I've been, but I think it's called um, topography or topography where they map, do the mapping. Okay. I was researching and reading this article about topography and they were talking about um, Black women's lived experiences and how um, a lot of people try to generalize the lived experiences of people but when you situate them in different geographical areas and get into like the details of what um, those people are experiencing, how they live life, uh, it, it was so drastic. And so I kind of was thinking that about this piece, though my initial aspect was thinking about migration and the mapping, as you can see, kind of in the body of the person um, and how um, the pineapple alongside um, people of African descent migrated together to South Carolina, which was the first shipment of where slaves um, came. So it kind of shows this journey, journeying through, but, um, and how that journey is kind of like a birth and a rebirth of your identity. So if you, if you look at the ear, it's kind of, it's, it's an embryo of a baby uh, with hearts coming out of it. And so, um, it's this constant ideal of rebirthing as you move from one place to the next and you're trying to recultivate your family, recultivate your identity, recultivate your sense of place and how that in itself is stressful, um, but is rooted in survival. So I looked at that and just married that with topography and just thinking about um, how we map our lived experiences. I think it's so interesting that you're, you're being inspired by topography because, um, of course, topography is is one of many ways to um, record and identify elevation changes. Mm -hmm. um, and for this particular artwork and several others, um, you have um, applied materials that essentially stand out in various elevations of relief. Yeah. So you've got, you know, the the background surface, which has been treated with the pineapple motif. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we have additional applications of things like bottle caps and, um, you know, these brads that are used to hold, you know, paper folders together, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which stand out in very high relief. Um, right. It's a little bit challenging to see it in this particular image, but all of these areas are actually metallic brads that are, um, you know, standing erect. And mm -hmm. um, so you've got this wide variety of um, heights and depths, which, mm -hmm. which sort of, you know, again, go back to reinforcing Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to do you want to share a different one with us too? Let's let's talk a little bit about the pineapple. Let, find, find a pineapple that you really that you really love, and let's talk let's talk about pineapples. Okay, okay. <laughs> let's see. Let's scroll through really quickly. Okay, here we go. Here's a here's a quick tour. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. We'll go with gray areas. Okay. That's, that's a new piece, but very much going back to the original meaning of the pineapple. Let's take a peek. Okay. Pineapple. So why the pineapple? So many things. Um, <laughs> Where do we start? Let's begin. 
I will initially say that the pineapple has always been my favorite fruit. Um, always my go-to as a child. So when I made this connection, it was very interesting. I began to use the pineapple initially as a way to simply use symbolism to lessen my episodes of depression or reduce my symptoms around depression. So um, I knew I liked the fruit. I was looking for clothes to wear with it, but I couldn't find any. So I began to paint it on my clothes. Then that transition to decorate my bathroom with it because that's the first place you go to in the morning. So I really was just trying to be intentional about increasing my mood. Um, from there, I just started to see pineapples. It's kind of like when you get a car and now you start seeing that same car. So I, I started to see pineapples everywhere. And initially, I was not thinking anything of it. I was just happy to smile in that moment. But then one day, I went to AutoZone to get some car mats. And I saw a pineapple. And I was like, why would a pineapple be in AutoZone? Um, their response was that it was an ashtray. But I bought it. And from that moment, I said, OK, I think there's something deeper here beyond the surface that I need to play with. And so I began to research the pineapple and I started to find all these um, very topical facts about it. You know, it doesn't like to be too acidic. It can grow in its natural environment up to 50 years. It has this uh, beneficial enzyme, bromelain. You can use the core to make pineapple tea. Um, you have to plant the crown to grow from one another. So I started to use that as an embodiment of self-concept and understanding how we as people in the journey of our life are related to the pineapple in many ways. Um, how we all have a spiky exterior that we hold, but we shouldn't be forced to get rid of those things because those things protect our core. We have to be in an, an environment that makes us feel safe enough to thrive and continue to grow from those things. So that came very easily with, for me because again, symbolism is my go-to. But one day I stumbled upon the history of the pineapple and I was like, wait a minute, say what now? <laughs> I was so shocked because again, I myself has always known the pineapple as a welcoming fruit. That's what I knew it as. That's what it was. Um, stand high, held up high, crown tall, that whole thing. Never thought anything else of it until I began to see the pineapple's placement alongside the lives of African um people and Black people. And I believe that the pineapple narrative and its um, relationship with the global commodification of Black lives and plantation labor is often very left out of the conversations around slavery. Um, then I began to find narratives that explored the pineapple um, as traveling to South Carolina as the first fruit. And it helped a lot of the uh, Western explorers when they would get sick, but they began to view the fruit as mystic because it couldn't survive those long journeys overseas. And so when it would survive, they would price it to be very, very high, very, very high, because that meant that they all were bringing along many slaves and the pineapple survived. So the pineapple became a symbolism of new shipment of African slaves. So they would stake the pineapple from their homes and that symbol alongside became coupled with the meaning of welcome. Um, and so you have these two narratives sitting at one time, but a, a whole nother narrative not even being explored or being completely dismissed or denied. And so at the time, Black people could not eat pineapples um, in this context of um, colonization. They could only serve it because it was for the wealthy, the rich, the aristocrats. People would even rent pineapples who could not afford it, just to have it as a piece in their home. And so gray areas became a thing for me because how often do we miss the gray areas when we're told one narrative? Um, and taking the time to get to the core of many narratives um, and thinking about collective symbolism and the collective unconscious. Oftentimes there are a lot of symbols in the world that um, the Eurocentric view has control over because they had the power to project that narrative. And so in thinking about the pineapple, I thought about the Confederate flag. I thought about the cross. I thought about um, water. 
um, all these things that we interact with and the, the symbolism of it, but those stories that have been forbidden or hidden or suppressed and denied who don't get to tell their stories. And so the pineapple was a way for me to, again, bring tough conversation to the table by welcoming it and using its own journey as a metaphor to talk about social issues and cultural issues, um, use it as a self symbol in a way to engage and interact with people and get people to see themselves as a pineapple because we all have an internal core um, and, uh, and a reason why we are here um, and map and use the topical facts about the pineapple and apply those to the art therapy process when talking about trauma and how do we peel back the layers of trauma and get to the core um, of those things. And ultimately this became my signature stamp like you know every I think I think every artist I can't say I think most artists want to eventually become a, to a point of their career where like they're known for this particular thing and so because I knew that the conversations that I was holding can be very challenging they can require a lot of attention and a lot for you to sit with a lot me understanding people's attention span and the capacity of what they can hold at any given time I knew that regardless of that they'll always remember the pineapple. And so one day, you know, they might want to return back and find it more, you know, more information um, about it. But if anything, when people look at my work, that will increase their mood immediately. And that's all that at the book, that's what I was concerned about. And beyond me, when they continue to see the pineapple in the world, they have something they can be reminded of or connect back to that they, they themselves can see themselves in this story. Um, as a witness, a participant, an observer, or someone who just wants to know more. Thank you for that. I um, am curious about whether or not there are, there are any other pieces that you feel are particularly indicative of what you're trying to say and what you're trying to question and these, um, as you say, spiky topics that we're mm -hmm. wrestling with. Um, there are several distinct series um, within this exhibition. They all, you know, circle around um, the same kinds of topics and the same, you know, areas of focus. Um, but, you know, we've, we definitely have um, some, some distinct, you know, collections within the larger whole. Do you, mm -hmm. do you want to talk a little bit about um, maybe even these these two here towards the towards the end of the digital exhibition, we've got yeah. sort of two separate um, thoughts happening here, even though they are certainly connected. Right. Um, I think from ignorance is a bliss is bliss on down to um, that last one. Um, though, but those five reflective distance. So th those five are a um, a journey of uh, my childhood up into um, where I am now, where I'm continuing to grow, uh, go towards. And this actually was done in 2014, a year after I decided to become a full-time artist. So I was really reckoning with who I knew myself as, who my mom had known me as, who my environments have known me as, and really grieving and accepting what I wanted to keep and removing what I wanted to get rid of. And so um, I really reflected back on my time in Africa uh, where I spent two months there and just processing all that I had experienced at that time and thinking about when I came back. And I think when I came back was my, my first that I can say like as a pre-adult um, reckoning with a mental health breakdown because for the life of me, I could not understand my internal bodily disruption that I was experiencing from having gone to a place where I just felt alive and welcomed and settled and grounded and to have experienced that and come back to the hustle and bustle of trying to navigate Black life in America just did it for me. And so this series um, kind of reflects and pays homage to that time in Africa when I came back 
And by my senior year, when they were asking me, um, you graduated summa cum laude, you've won this award, why aren't you going to go get your master's? What's happening? <laughs> Everybody else knows what they're doing. All of your classmates are graduating and going to the next step. What are you doing? Because your academic achievement does not say what we're hearing you talk. And in that moment, you feel crazy, you know, because you're, you're choosing to deny yourself and break up with this relationship you've had with academia and social constructs. And you're choosing to take a risk on your faith and what you feel like is in your heart. And a lot of people can't understand that when it's happening and you're human, so you're gonna be impacted by what people think and say. I mean, you're not a robot. So I felt uh, a lot of grief. I cried for like two weeks straight. Uh, I told my mom like, I'm, I'm afraid because I just didn't know, but I knew that I, I wasn't ready to go into a program because it was, it, was, it was something else that needed to happen for me before I did that. And so this kind of pays homage to that phase um, of my life. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank you for being so vulnerable, um, not only here with us today, but through your work. I think that, um, you know, if, if, if we have more models of individuals who, um, you know, recognize their own, um, struggles and their own um, vulnerabilities and humanity and, and are able to talk about that in such um, stark relief, you know, um, either the way you're doing with us now or through artwork that's on public display, I think it really can give inspiration and courage to others who are feeling those same kinds of um, feelings of um, fear and sadness and anxiety and isolation and uncertainty and, um, you know, persecution. Yeah. Um, A lot and so thank you for that. Thank you for yeah. that. Um, are you willing to, to spend a minute or two talking about um, the most recent yeah. pieces in in this, well, these aren't the most recent pieces in the show, but this is but, the most recent um, yeah. series in, in the exhibition. Yeah, the, the, the next five, um, I just want to point out the tundos because I love them. I um, and I started to have another symbolic moment of my connection with circular things because mm -hmm. a lot of symbolism in Africa was about circle and togetherness and community and communal. And I always felt limited with square canvases but at the time, that's the only thing I had sight of and knew that existed. Um, but I was at the Sharon Tree one day when it was up and running. Shout out to the Sharon Tree. Um, <laughs> hey, Carly. And I would always go to Carly and try to find found objects and stuff. And I saw all these tundos. I, I want them all. Give them to me all. And so um, this was pre-pandemic, but still kind of approaching pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the unrest with Black Lives Matter and all the social justice issues. And again, going back to that race-based traumatic stress, going back to that PTSD symptomology um, of what my initial research thesis was on in undergrad was about PTSD symptomology, racism, and the Black experience. And so these took more on a research based, like very distinct research based um, aspect when I was looking at the social, cultural, political factors that really shape and influence um, the spectrum of Black life and Black experiences. And so the casualty of a white lie really honed in on how powerful the statement of a white person was against a Black person and still is. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you can talk about the familiarity of um, the Emmett Till case, because it's the most world-renowned one, but there are so many documented but not nationally known stories of um, white people spinning a narrative to, 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 keep the, to keep racism and race still alive. Um, and that bothered me, that bothered me because there's this paradox of like, 
sticks and stones and break my bones or words never hurt me. But you literally have people using words to uphold a narrative that 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 is impacting communities at large. And we still see those lasting effects of that to this day. So this particular image, an individual, the black guy in the bottom left, um, had been accused of raping a white woman. And it was a false accusation. And you see the rippling effects of the community trying to come together at the top, but overseeing and watching with like hope, but little hope, very little hope. You see family members distress and crying and breaking down. You see people, you know, having very bodily visceral reactions. You see the time clock centered, just waiting, the anticipation. And so I was really sitting with um, those narratives and I used that particular example because it's directly related to the history of the mental health field mm -hmm. and how it all came about that a lot of the narratives that were written were written to uphold that Black people were a deficit and dysfunctional or had some abnormalities just because they would not mend into the white Eurocentric narrative. So anything opposite of that was considered abnormal. And this was so concrete, concrete that um, you had these stories of black men falsely raping white women or um, any type of reaction, any type of reactive behavior that they deemed not normal would then be classified as a deficit and a narrative will be created. And then researchers, like psychologists, researchers will go in, um, do research on their narrative and then use their implicit bias and biases to develop this data. And then black people are more prone to be criminals. Black people are more prone to be. So you get these narratives written concretely and then they will take that information and give it to policy and then policy will take it and then vote and pass these laws and policies around the ways Black people can navigate life. And that was just so bizarre to me because it's so cut and dry for me, but we're still here years later unpacking what is there. Like, it's evident that this is a thing. So that's what this entire kind of series is, is talking about the descendants, you know, our ancestral past and how it started to brew and develop back then and during that time um, of the navigation of coming, coming over here um, and creating those narratives, um, upholding those narratives of who had the right and the freedom, you know, to do this and how you as black people almost were forced to choose on how you were gonna survive um, in this mental game. Um, midnight in Mississippi um, is along those same lines with a very specific uh, narrative being from Mississippi and thinking about those um, sundown time, uh, towns that you don't ride through and you don't go through and just the fear and people, people live by these narratives. And so when, when you talk about element of choice and do we have a choice as a people and every day you can wake up and you can choose and choose, you know, I, I, I think that's problematic because I think it misses the gray areas of what influences people's choice because we are not robots and our choices are rooted out of, rooted out of beliefs and emotions. And we have things like this going on that's constantly instilling fear and creating these narratives then what choices do you really leave people with? Um, so those are some of the things that you know I, 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 I just think about and I sit with um, as, a, as a mental health um, practitioner that is focuses on you know racism and social justice and things from that framework. Right. Let's let's, if you will, use the last couple of minutes to sort of bring this, bring it full circle. What what about 
the act of creation? Do you feel as an art therapist and an artist yourself who uses this as a therapeutic tool helps in the healing? I mean, can you, I, I know that's sort of a really high level question, but help us sort of understand why does making something help heal? Mm -hmm. So there are very, you know, clinical answers when you think about, for instance, like neuroplasticity, which, which is the ability to rewire. So art can come in and disrupt certain things when it comes to the level of um, hormones that are being released, more serotonin, less dopamine, things like that. Um, so it takes on a clinical, a physiological aspect of reducing stress um, and those things kind of roll over into the ability to problem solve, to regulate your own emotions, to gain insight and awareness, um, to build your self-esteem and intuition, to cre create conversations for social change, um, to give you distance between you and the problem, um, to observe yourself in a, in a symbolic metaphoric way, um, to offer yourself grace and forgiveness, um, to cathartically place make and not questions or releasing judgment. Um, frustration tolerance, working through something, seeing something through, uh, sitting with it time and time again, um, letting the process do what the process needs to do. Um, so, you know, there are many, many, many things that art hits on the cognitive le level uh, when you think about developmental language. Um, when you think about uh, spatial um, accessibility, relying on nonverbal techniques versus depression, intimidation that trauma can cause when you can't have access to words quickly or right then. Um, the emotional um, aspect, as I said, when you think about high levels of stress and cortisol and to be able to work towards um, having an equilibrium and balance internal because we know that a lot of the diseases that arise are because our immune system is shifted and compromised and so constantly staying at a equilibrium with that um physical active fine motor skills and just and just moving and releasing um spiritual mental so there are so many ways that art overlaps um with different things that can be very beneficial for an individual a family a community of people but I go back to freedom. When you outlay all the clinical and high-end mental, correct, logical terms, when you think about if we as people, if each individual was able to have that that I just described, they will ultimately have freedom. And there will be a different relationship with the outward external conditions in which we engage that we try to use for coping. So by no means am I saying that people won't still struggle with, you know, difficult choices via substance abuse or via unhealthy eating, you know, via procrastination, via overthinking. I'm not saying that those things still won't exist, but I am saying that I believe that art can serve as a preventative measure and serve as some type of balance to bring people back into their freedom, to know that they don't have to be bound by these things. Um, and there's always an option. There's always an option. There's always an option. And so right now I think we're in a state of life and have been where survival doesn't put us in the state of options. Survival puts us in what's ever in front of us. That's what we choose. We need that immediate release, gratification, to feel good, whatever that is. So um, I think it's important because it ultimately will lend itself to, to, to freedom. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for your day. Um, they, they have been inspiring and um, enlightening. Um, again, I'm
grateful for you being willing to to be so open and so um so honest about your experiences and, and what you've learned along the way in in being a practitioner and how that can serve others mm -hmm. um you know if, if ever we needed an endorsement to create you just gave us one you, you gave us a prescription for art making <laughs> Go make some so art. I, I would I would encourage all of our attendees today and anyone who may um, watch this later to um, to take that prescription and to fill it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> go ahead and fill it. Um, and and as you said, you know, let go of judgment. Um, you know, when when we're making, that can often creep in. Mm -hmm. um, but the act of making and the joy of the materials and the you know, the exploration through the process is, is actually, you know, the part that can be the most meaningful. So right. thank you for showing us the way and thank you for, um, for giving us such incredible um, work to inspire and to inform. Um, we have um, a, a applause, applause from Natasha says yes to freedom and thank you for the beauty you share. Absolutely, Natasha, I couldn't agree more. Um, thank you all again, those of you who were joining us today. Um, big applause to each of you for being arts supporters and enthusiasts. Um, Lacey says, I love this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lacey. <laughs> Melissa says, awesome work. Awesome, my best so friend. inspiring. <laughs> thank you for thank you all of your, your comments. And um, Chris says, thank you. Thank you, Chris. We are delighted to be able to offer these artists talks on um, a regular basis. So please do be sure to touch base with COCA on a regular um, basis just to see who's who's coming up next. The exhibitions that we produce, of course, rotate through the gallery spaces that we manage and oversee. And um, April is going to be on display, not herself, but her work <laughs> is gonna, it's gonna be on display for um, a good long while. Your show is on view until June 13th at the airport gallery or online at the um, digital online gallery that COCA hosts. So please do um, spend some time looking either in person or digitally and feel free to share that same invitation to others who you feel can um, really connect with and benefit from this work. So thank you again, April. Yeah, thank you so Delighted much. Delighted to have you. <laughs> yes, I, I love these. It's, it's always something new. It's always something new um, that comes up, which is again, mirrors the, the journey of healing. You know, when you think you found all the answers, you surprise yourself. It's like, oh, I'm finding this out as I talk. Hmm, I'm making these connections as I talk. Um, so no, I appreciate this and I appreciate the space. And again, just thank you for the opportunity. Um, I remember my first time I came into Coca and was trying to get just familiar with the art scene here in Tallahassee and to see um the so support and how they has gone grown. Um, truly grateful, truly grateful. Would definitely be a large chunk of my testimony. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We are delighted to have been able to spend this time with you today, and we wish you a very good rest of the afternoon. So thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>